Hey, and welcome to the Welding Tips and Tricks podcast. I'm Jonathan Lewis, here with Jody Collier. Hello. Roy Crumb Ryan. How's it going? And our special guest, Nate Martin. Hi, everybody. Nate is the diving welding supervisor for Phoenix International. And you know, the one of the more popular questions or the more popular career paths that comes up online and on the forums and just in general is to be a quote-unquote underwater welder. Nate reached out to us to be on the podcast to talk about what he does, uh, being a commercial diver and everything. And we thought we would talk about that and clear up some, I guess, try to clear up some of the misconceptions of an underwater welder versus a commercial diver and what they actually do. I think it's an interesting field. I have no desire to be an underwater welder slash commercial diver. It's going to be interesting to see what Nate has to say about this. Yeah, it's going to be fun having somebody that's in the game right now and that's current. And so we're not talking about something that's 30-year-old news, you know. So any changes that are that have come along, it's going to be interesting to hear. And this should be the real scoop on what it takes to be an underwater welder and uh, ins and outs. Mm-hmm. I actually uh, tried applying for the Navy to be an underwater welder and uh, was medically denied. So it'll be interesting to hear what I was going to get into. <laughs> <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly, I guess. So, Nate, let's start out with a little bit of your background. How did you get into, I guess, welding in general or diving? And, and Just tell us your, your beginnings and where you, how you got to where you are now. Sure thing. So, first of all, hey, thanks for having me on the show, guys. Welding is the family business. My father owns a welding company in the D.C. area called Indian Head Ironworks. And uh, probably my earliest memory is him taking me into a fabrication shop and telling me not to look at that light that it was going to burn my eyes. And I pretty much started full-time in 1990 when I was about, uh, I guess I was about 12 years old, just sweeping up the shop, practicing after hours, a little bit here and there, and just going on the road with my father. He also had a crane and forklifts and all that stuff, and I'd get to play around in the yard, and I would go out on job sites, kind of an oiler on the crane, and I would set the pads down, things like that as a pretty young kid. And so I had a pretty fun childhood. Uh, I used to do things like sit on the headache ball and get run up 100 feet in the air. And <laughs> <laughs> sort of things you definitely wouldn't see people doing nowadays, but we had a good time, and luckily I made it out of that. But uh, So my father's business basically had a lock on a power plant local to where we were living at in Maryland. And when I turned 18 and I was old enough to get into the plant, I went to work and started learning the trade of pipe fitting and pipe welding, and uh, I was kind of on path to become a boiler maker, and I really enjoyed that. did everything from shoveling coal down in the pit all the way up to mirror welding chromoly pipes on top of the steam drums, and uh, so I did that till I was about 22 or 23, and they actually had an intake pipe that went out into the Potomac River, and they called me up one day and said, hey, Nate, uh, could you guys do any diving? And of course, I didn't turn anything down. So I said, yeah, of course. And I knew my father had done some scuba diving back in the 70s. So I, I rogered us up to it. We went and took a, an inflatable pig out of a pipe that was an intake for the pump house that would bring the uh, river water in to be turned, eventually turned into steam in the power plant. And it went okay. The company man on the project, when we were leaving, he said, look, we're going to get you to do all our diving. So I decided, well, I better go to school and, and learn something about this before I get hurt. So in about 1999, I took off and headed down to the oil patch in Louisiana, and I went to a diving school down there. And diving schools generally go for about six months, and you get what's called just a certified diver's, commercial diver's ticket, just a cert. And uh, it's either what's called an IMCA cert, which is the International Marine Contractors Association, I believe, or the ADCI cert. And that's kind of our country's version of the same thing. From there, I hired on with Phoenix International, my current employer. And I was a tender for a short while. And uh, tender is like a entry-level diver. On average, you would do that for about three years, sort of learn to trade. You, you make a couple dives here or there. Uh, the more you prove yourself in the water, the more chances you'll get to get in the water. And eventually, they'll do what they call is breaking you out. When you break out, you become a little young baby diver. And a lot of times, you don't make quite as much money because you went from being at the top of the heap to now you're back at the bottom. But uh, it's definitely what you're aspiring to be. You know, you just so I'm actually on a job right now. The company I work for, Phoenix, we have a contract with the U.S. Navy. We do pretty much all of their hyperbaric welding, uh, repairing ships. I did a short stint with a company called 
oceaneering and uh, did what we call saturation diving. Is you know generally deep dive and you stay down for a long time. And uh, but I spend most of my time out in the golf and the oil patch fixing platforms. That's about it. Can you uh, back up for a minute and explain to the listeners, make sure everybody knows what hyper- hyperbaric welding is? Right. So hyperbaric, in short, just means uh, an elevated pressure. So there's two types of underwater welding, and that's dry and wet. Dry is performed in a coffer dam. And so what that is, is essentially if you have a repair to make and the weld has to meet same quality requirements as a topside weld. You would basically put a box over where this repair is going to take place. You evacuate all the water, take all your tools up inside the box, and you would perform the weld repair the same as anybody else would. Now, it's obviously the pressure and the confined space to have a definite effect on the weld. There's a lot of different techniques and different nuances involved with that. Uh, the other type of welding, wet welding, is you are in the water, uh, stingers in your hand, and you're welding completely in the wet. That's use the term coffer dam or something. That's uh, is that another name for a hyperbaric chamber? I, or well, we we would mostly call them habitat. Mm-hmm. And that's that's pretty much the general slang term. But I guess uh, more more technical would be a coffer dam. But us divers, we pretty much always call them habitats. And gotcha. in the habitat, you would have usually you just have a ton of tools in there, and and they're tight. And the way to be successful in a habitat is to keep them neat and clean, just like any pretty much any regular job shop. Things can go pretty bad pretty quick if you get in there and you just kind of make a nest out of all your tools. So. In general, in a habitat, you would have what we call the habitat umbilical, and that usually consists of a blowdown hose, which just adds pressurized air to the habitat. You have an exhaust hose. It just does the exact opposite thing. You just have a valve in each end, and uh, you'd open your valve, and it just takes a suction. And so not only do these, these two hoses do a couple of things. One, they could add breathing air to the habitat, but they also keep the bubble down. So not all habitats always are 100% sealed. A lot of times they leak, and uh, you just have to keep the blowdown going fast enough that it keep a bubble in there for you. And the exhaust can equalize that for you so if you get them set just right you can usually keep the water right at the bottom and it also it keeps a nice fresh air exchange in there and it it sucks out the welding fumes so it's like having a, a fume extractor right next to your well we don't necessarily take our diving equipment off inside the habitat we wear what we call agas agas and they're sometimes you'll see scuba divers wearing them they're more of a full face mask sort of scuba hood and they have communications to supervisor at topside and uh, sometimes we'll put lights on them so you have basically like a headlamp on your forehead other things in the umbilical would be the communications to a bullhorn so like if you lose comms In your AGA, the supervisor can address you like through a PA system. There's also a couple of light cables, and we just we run uh, lighting down there from the surface. The what a sample line, so it's just a hose with a valve on the end, and open the valve when you get in there, and we run that to a meter topside to kind of we can tell how much O2 is in the atmosphere and inert some inert gases and things like that. And if you want to get out of your AGA, say after a couple hours and take a drink, you radio up to your, your supervisor, you ask, how's my atmosphere? And if they say you look good, you can take your hat off. So, and then there's like, you know, we'll, uh, mostly we use pneumatic tools. So for our grinders and our buffers and our die grinders, those are all generally compressed air from a tool compressor up top. Uh, if they don't give you enough power, We'll use hydraulic grinders, big, beefy, like nine-inch grinders on hydraulic hose. So that's in there, and that takes up a lot of space. Uh, we do a lot of non-destructive evaluation as well. So anytime we weld, we're, we're usually doing mag particle inspection or sometimes ultrasonic inspection, and we'll have all that stuff up in there with us as well. Then you got tons of hand tools and, and pretty much the same general stuff that, you know, topside welders would use. But it's important to make sure you're... You're prepared before you get in the habitat because like most dive, you have a, a limited amount of bottom time and you're trying to be as efficient as possible. So we generally try to take everything we may need for the next couple of days in there. And uh, so we're ready for whatever comes across at us. How big are these hyperbaric chambers? Well, I have been in, smallest one I've been in is about four foot by four foot and wow. uh, maybe about maybe about six feet tall. And so all that same stuff. Jeez. He's up in that little box, yeah. I thought I was I've in a small been, spot. <laughs> <laughs> and I've even been in one where we had two guys, brother-in-law in a well, in a habitat that size. So, But the biggest one I've ever been in 
is actually the one that I'm going to be in on this job I'm currently working on. And this habitat will encompass an entire rudder on the back of a Navy ship. And so it's about, uh, I want to say it comes in three parts, it's three tiered. It's about maybe 20 to 25 feet tall. Uh, it's about another 20 feet wide and another 15 feet long or something like that. So, I mean, it's going to be a gigantic habitat. And if you can imagine wow. how much buoyancy and how much lift that's going to be on the back of this ship when it's full of air. So the rigging's got to be right. Uh, you know, those aspects of the job are very important when you're in a habitat because you know, I've known a couple guys where the rigging failed on a habitat and they rode that thing to the surface and back down. So you got to really have your rigging skills kind of wired tight when you're doing that type of work too. Define rigging skills on that. Well, you got to know how to read the tag on the side of the strap, that's for sure, and kind of know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm not going to try to read that's too important. much into that one, but... But yeah, <laughs> that sounds like so, a you know you kind of you got to be able to follow directions and know how to read a print. And when the engineers call out a certain uh, rating on a certain strap here or shackle there, you know you can't necessarily. If, maybe if you don't have it next to you in the toolbox, you can't just grab whatever the first thing you see is. So you really got to kind of be on your on your game a little bit and make sure you're using the right stuff. And uh, so is that rigging keeping you down? Is that what you're saying? Or is well, this the rigging that lowers you down? Well, the rigging on a habitat, if you think about it, it kind of in some ways it pulls it up and pulls it down and pulls it in. So let's take a rudder, for example. Uh, if we're working on the, just the side of, the, of a rudder or even a hull of a ship or platform, you have to make the flange mating surface that's going to seal to whatever it is you're repairing. It has to contour fit. And normally what we'll do is put like two to four inches of rubber around that, that seal, foam rubber. And so there has to be a certain amount of rigging that can compress that foam and hold the weight of that habitat into and on the object that you're going to eventually be clearing out the water from. But mm. then once you add all that air in, there's a tremendous amount of lift. So there also has to be what we call downhaul rigging. So that way this that habitat doesn't peel off and head for the surface on whatever it is you're you're working on. And then there's of course the rigging from the crane. You know, if we, we put the habitat over the side, these things could weigh uh, oh I don't know, this one we're getting in tomorrow, I think maybe thirty tons or something like that. So they can be pretty big stuff. Usually there's just one person, maybe two divers at a time that set these things. So if you can imagine sometimes you're on a job and you know, we might be in the shipyard and the, the shipyard guys that take the habitat off the truck, there might be 15 of them working on that job. But then when it gets in the water, we disconnect it from the crane and there's one guy in limited visibility doing this by himself. So, you really, you know, you got to know what you're doing and because uh, things can start to go bad pretty fast. And you don't want to drop the coffer dam on bottom, especially if you're in deep water, you might not ever see it again. Yeah. So most of the habitats then, they go down and then you evacuate the water out of them? Right. So what you do, you'd make that seal, you know, you really got to have all your measurements right. And so let's say you're doing a, for example, the repair we're going to do tomorrow. We actually have two habitats on this gig. We got one small one on one rudder and then this monster on the other. So this small repair we're doing on the other rudder, it's about two feet long. Well, you really got to mark out where this, this habitat's going to go. So if you take the time to set this thing, put all the rigging on, everybody's watching. There's probably five people in the dive shack watching and making sure it's going correctly but if you put all the rigging on evacuate this thing down that takes a good amount of time last thing you want to do is end up having this thing not quite centered and not giving yourself enough room to say put preheat pads where you need to put them because last thing you want to do is have to fill this thing back up with water loosen all the rigging just to move it four inches one way or the, or the other so you know it, mm. It's like fitting. It's it's like anything else. You want to take your time to make sure you're getting the proper fit. That extra hour you may take putting the habitat on could eventually save you 10 hours down the road, you know? Yeah. So now all the tools and everything that are in there, they all just get soaked? Yes. Yeah, so, well, <laughs> the things that... The, <laughs> The things that need to stay dry, what we'll do is generally send them down in pelican cases. Uh, if you're working relatively shallow, a pelican case can stay dry to, say, well, I don't know, you can count on it to stay dry down to about 40 feet or so. Hmm. Uh, they can be hard to pull down. Uh, if, <laughs> if, you got a really, if you got a really big pelican case, it's like pulling some giant air-filled balloon down. So you try to put some weight in there 
or either you you have one of those tenders pull it down to you so you don't have to worry about it. If you're going deeper, a lot of times we'll use like uh, paint cans, uh, you like pressurized paint cans because they have a much better seal. Hmm. And rods are generally transferred because, you know, rods cannot be wet whatsoever. So we'll put those in what we call a rod canister. And that's basically just a stainless steel tube that has a valve on top and a mating surface will stick however many rods we need down in there, made up the sealing surface and then pressurize the canister. So it's always hmm. overpressurized from whatever depth it is you're going to. So basically the water can't get in there anyways. But also we use those uh, impulse sealers. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with like uh, how people might package food to ship around. It's like a, sort of like a thick plastic bag. And mm-hmm. you put whatever you need, like your welding gloves. Obviously, you want your welding gloves to be very dry. So you roll them up as tightly as you can. You put them in this plastic, and you melt a seal. And you might double or triple bag everything. So sometimes, even if the uh, the Pelican case might completely leak, all your tools are still dry. You've sealed everything in plastic. So hmm. that's what makes, like, if you have a blowout in the, in the habitat and it floods, man, it can really ruin your day because it can set you back a couple of days, you know. Hmm. How deep do you go with those type of things? Well, the deepest habitat job I've ever done, I've personally been in, was about 100 feet. I have a couple of friends that have done them at about 700 feet. Uh, But on average, underwater welding is done relatively shallow uh, in comparison to, like, the rest of the diving industry. So, you know, it could get pretty expensive, and if you can engineer out diver welders, that's going to be your first option. Like if, uh, let's say you have a structural member on a platform that's broken that needs to be repaired, they're going to try to do it with a clamp, like a, a bolt-on clamp, first and foremost. But uh, if for whatever reason they can, or if the engineers figure out that it's, it's going to be better to do a welding repair, then they'll, they'll give us a call. But in general, 30 feet is probably where most of your underwater welding is going to happen, somewhere around there. And I would say the, the lion's share of hyperbaric welding or underwater, underwater welding is to repair ships. So if there's, say, a small crack in a hull or the rudder or something that needs any kind of thing on the hull that needs a weld repair, if you can do that in the habitat, you may save the owner of the vessel a lot of money because they don't have to dry dock it. That's where we come in. Mm-hmm. What, what's the material type on that rudder that you're talking about, the, the m- most recent thing? HY80, and also oh. there's, a, there's a cast that we'll be tying into, so it's a big HY80 cast, and so that preheat's going to be up to almost 300 degrees, and we currently have the preheats on the casting right now, and uh, it's been on there for most of the day, and it's going to be in there all night, and we got some guys at the pier now keeping an eye on it, because it's going to take a solid day to bring that large hunk of metal up to this 300 some odd degree preheat we'll be welding the the shell plating back to that casting so you know we're going to do that with a 118 rod we do a lot of habitat dry welding with 118 Mm -hmm. low hydrogen rod and it's it can be a little squirrely to run you know it can it can get kind of soupy on you and that same rod you can run it top side and you get it in the habitat and for whatever reason it just doesn't act right for lack of a better term, but it takes a little bit of practice to get to where you can kind of control it the same way you would top set. Hmm. Interesting. So how do you get into the hyperbaric chambers for those that may or may not know about them or don't see a picture of them? Yeah, usually they're they're just open bottom. So they would seal all the way around and you would climb in from the bottom and we, we call that the trunk. And the bigger habitats would have a ladder attached to it. And usually what you do is you get in there and you might have a a fold down grating like a plastic grating with a with a framework around it and it hangs on chains so you get up inside of there then you, you set that grating down and it gives you a place to stand on but even in the habitat like you, you know think about everybody listening to this you're out in the shop and you drop your chipping hammer <laughs> it's it's no big deal to reach down and pick it up but for mm-hmm. us a lot of times that thing goes bouncing out of the habitat and, and it gets deep six and so you better bring down two chipping hammers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that so could be bad. <laughs> you gotta really, yeah, that's the big thing about diving, man. You get a lot of a lot of tools, especially us welders. You get a lot of little hand tools, a lot of little stuff, and you gotta really be careful not to start dropping stuff because it can it can totally blow your dive. Just the simplest thing, you know. Do you 
one I, I'm kind of interested in hearing on what are some of the big misconceptions of being an underwater welder. Yep. Mm. Well, we're all rich for one thing. <laughs> uh, that's probably the biggest one you know i see a lot of times a lot of times you know and uh, i'm on instagram somebody might post a picture of underwater welders there's always a comment about how those guys make five hundred thousand dollars a year or something like that and you can make good money but it's it's feast or famine uh so if you make a bunch of money this summer and don't spend it all on dirt bikes and everything, because this winter you're probably going to be sitting around waiting on a phone call. So mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a big one. Uh, what else? If you get between the ground and the stinger, it's instant death. That's a big one. Uh, it's really not quite as dangerous as what everybody makes it out to be. Um, you get shocked a little bit, like if you're wet welding. That's where it's, you get shocked a lot wet welding. But the way we mitigate that is to wear big, thick insulated rubber gloves and usually under those we'll wear exam gloves uh, like the latex gloves i personally don't like to get shocked even a little bit so i wear as much uh, insulation as i can but it, it doesn't take much you know normally you just you're wearing the same thing uh surfers wearing you just have a wetsuit on and and uh boots and coveralls but your gloves like i said are generally we call them big blues they're like the big uh type of gloves people handling chemicals and things would wear i guess that's about it you know I can't really think of anything else off the top of my head. I, I read about some of the some of the least glamorous jobs that under some underwater welders do, you know, at, at power plants and diving in sewage and things like that. What percentage of the work out there would you say is that as opposed to doing the kind of stuff that you do? Well, in commercial diving, there's pretty much two different types. There's offshore and there's inland. Offshore is about 95% oil field related, uh, platforms, drilling rigs. Inland, you can find yourself doing all, all types of stuff, uh, like the ship's husbandry, like I was talking about, basically just, just repairing ships, um, municipality type work, and that's where you might run into some of the, the hazmat diving, bridge work, dock construction, pile driving, there's a lot of different facets to inland diving. And there's a lot of welding that happens in, in both of those. And I kind of exist in my career on, on both sides. These days, I spend a lot more time offshore, but I certainly have split my career probably about half and half offshore and inland diving. So thankfully, I've only got into the kind of the nasty stuff a few times, but I've definitely, I've, I've definitely done it, you know. So. Would you say you have a preference? Well... I would say that in terms of the diving aspect of things, the actual underwater work, I'll take offshore any day. A lot of times it can be crystal clear water. You're working on really big stuff, fish everywhere. It's fun. It's just There's just this absolute joy I have when I'm in the water offshore. Now, the lifestyle of inland diving is something to be totally desired. I mean, I, there's been times in my life where I've felt like I'm about as close to being a rock star without being a rock star as you could get, you know, just... Traveled around the world a few times. They put us up in some really nice hotels. And if you're a diver and you're on the job, you're usually near water. So a lot of times we're staying right on the beach and, and uh, enjoying that sort of lifestyle. The Navy work that we do, it's under a lot of scrutiny. There's usually a company rep in there from NAVC. There's a third-party inspector in the dive shack. There's, uh, you know, maybe a couple engineers in there. There might There's maybe the captain of the vessel or the chief engineers in there so there's a lot of brass in there watching what you're doing it's definitely a very tradesman atmosphere you know you're you're definitely existing on sort of a journeyman level of being a welder and the guys that do that type of work are the guys that could probably step into the welding world and make a career if they just went into welding now a lot of times if you go offshore and you're diving i mean these you sort of have to be a jack of all trades and uh, you got to know a lot about rigging and maybe welding and cutting underwater cutting process and, and putting pipelines together and nuts and bolts and things like that. And those sometimes don't necessarily translate into a very specific thing that you could do outside of diving. But uh, but I guess in short, I'm probably most proud of my time in the wall patch. Mm. I'm going to go back like 40 years when I was in school. We had, they had an underwater welder who lived locally came and gave a slideshow presentation. So we learned a little bit even back then about uh, the difference in wet welding and hyper hyperbaric welding. And, you know, they were running like a pipeline 
where they would, you know, weld a certain depth, but then they would, you know, eventually the, the line would be dropped down. I think that's what I what I recall anyway. But one thing that he told me that resonates with something you said was he said a lot of times you got to be a tender for a while, like longer than you want. You got to break into it. It's kind of clickish, and you got to pay your dues and. You might have to be a tender for a while, just, you know, doing whatever, helper work. And also, he said that companies seem to be more interested in diving skills and would rather you even teach you to weld than you being a welder and them teaching you to dive. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I can tell you that I hope the welding world doesn't shun me for this, but it's probably easier to turn a good diver into a welder than it is to turn a good welder into a good diver. A lot of people, they, they get in the water and... They may have gone to dive school for six months. You, you get in the water offshore, and, and some people, it just it's just not for everybody, you know. Like, uh, I've seen guys hit the water, and it, it just changes them, and, and they just they want to get out as fast as they can. And there's a lot of pressure on you, figuratively and literally, when you're underwater and offshore. I mean, let's take, for example, uh, a recent habitat job I was running offshore, and, and we were working for a client that had a tension leg platform, and they're trying to extend the life of this thing so they can keep it out there producing, just pumping gas and oil and making a lot of money. But it's this thing's coming to sort of the end of its expected lifespan. So they're they're doing a lot of retrofit to it. They're fixing it up. And there were some cracks in what's called the tendon porch. And what that is is just the framework that connects to the tendon and the tendon connects to the seafloor. And this is what keeps this thing anchored and floating in the in the water way offshore. Well, we're on a dynamic positioning vessel, and there's about 70 people on this boat. And when you get in the water, everybody's there for this one job. And if we're diving one person at a time, there's a lot of money and a lot of people expecting you to get something done in the water. And you may only have an hour of bottom time or, or less. And, you know, it's something you got to tell guys, like, uh, you know, I'm, when I'm supervising, I, I make sure people understand that, hey, you need to be pre prepared for this dive because it might be a $100,000 a day spread just to get you in the water to do some work. So it's a kind of a big deal when you when you really think about it, you know. Mm -hmm. You're the only you're the only guy actually down there performing. Everybody else is there just to support you. So you kind of need to have your stuff together, and you got to really take it serious. And uh, if you're not prepared for that, it's it's just not the industry for you. What do you think is the turnover rate in your industry then? It's huge. Uh, <laughs> I would say if if ten people come out of school and come down to the Gulf of Mexico, I would say on average maybe one guy becomes a professional diver really it, and it might wow. even 10 is probably a too small of a number if 100 guys came down i'm guessing maybe maybe 20 of them might hang out you know probably not even that and then you know a lot of guys they might break out which to me it still means a lot to break out in the gulf of mexico and I, i'm always uh very happy to hear when a guy breaks out it's something they should be very proud of but then that you know they might for whatever reason it's not always just that you know you couldn't hack it or whatever and sometimes you know a lot of times it's not that it's just you know you guys on previous episodes like jody was talking about how you really got to chase the work down and when i go away to work i leave my family i got a i got a wife and three little kids and if i'm making a paycheck at all i'm away from them so that that sort of lifestyle starts to weigh on people and you end up just not wanting to chase that work so much so mm -hmm. and communication offshore where the beach is really not that great you know we just in the last 10 years or so we started getting internet out there and you know if you try to facetime your wife or, or watch a video or something you start bogging down the internet and nobody gets to use it and they cut it off and so you got to kind of like in some ways you got to kind of leave the family at the beach and that sucks for sure yeah. how long do you think is your average offshore i mean being out there i mean away from dry land and family uh i'd say average is probably three weeks, I guess. Uh, okay. Summertime is our season. From about mid-May to beginning of October, that's kind of the diving season out in the Gulf of Mexico. The water is flat, calm most of the time, so companies will plan their projects for that time of year. Uh, in the wintertime, you're lucky to get five days of divable weather. You know, the seas get too rough, and you can't hold station with your vessel, and it can start to get pretty dangerous, especially if you're down deep and 
you know, you don't know if you're, you're going to have a runoff with your boat. So <laughs> you can't just yank a guy right out of the water. I mean, you can, I guess, depending on what's safer, putting him, putting him in the chamber and treating him for possible decompression sickness or leaving him down there while the, the boat's squirrely and nobody has control of it. So, so in short, uh, there's a season and it's eh, about four months. You'll be on longer jobs in the summertime. You know, you might, you might go out for a month or something here or there, but, uh, like I said, about, about three weeks is probably your average. Most I've ever done in one year was about, uh, I guess about 340 to 350 days offshore. And, uh, that was post Katrina Rita when the golf had just been completely decimated. They needed people out there and there was always a job and I just stayed and I had a great year, but you know, at the end of that year, I, I got that final paycheck and kind of saw how much I made for the year. And I'm not gonna lie, there was a lot of zeros, but it kind of affected me in a different way. And I just, all I could think about was, you know, how much time I spent away from home and, and it really wasn't worth it to me. So I try to have a work-life balance the best I can. And, uh, you know, I take advantage of the time when I'm home and every now and then I have to turn down a job, you know, and, but as my wife and I say, there's always another job. Right. So you're pretty much a contract welder in, in a way then. Well, I definitely am a full-time employee of Phoenix, but I, I, I know what you're saying. It's like, you know, we definitely go from job to job, and you may not know where that next big paycheck is coming from. I mean, I'm pretty lucky at Phoenix in that they let us come into the shop. You know, you're obviously your rate in the shop is going to be significantly less than what you're going to make in the field, but... You know, you you may be able to na- make enough to kind of cover the bills for the month or whatever. And uh, I'm very appreciative that they let us do that because a lot of dive companies, especially in these lean times like this, with oil fields not really kicking it right now. So they might just tell people, don't come into the shop. We'll call you when we got something. So. Right. But of course, you know, with nowadays being a superintendent, I do some project management from time to time. You know, I, I definitely spend a lot of time on the computer in the office and at home, too. So I usually stay pretty well hooked up. Cool. I want to go back to what you said, unless somebody else has something. I don't want to take too many questions. I've got like a list. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned earlier that the welding itself is different than down below than it is on dry land. Can you expound on that a little bit more? Like uh, com- compared the 118 versus uh, between the two and, and what the difference is and what are some of the things that you have to do different underwater than on dry land? Sure. Well, let's uh, let's talk about wet welding a little bit then. So that, that's probably, you know, that's where you're going to see your far and away are going to be your biggest differences. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's night and day from topside welding and even in the habitat. So one thing right off the bat, the weld makes... A, like a gas pocket so obviously like you know a stick rod the flux burns off and makes a gas covering well that in a wet welding rod that gas is going to be finding its way up so if you're doing an overhead groove weld you don't you can't really see what the hell it is you're doing so because it's making this gas so that's one major difference uh obviously the quenching effect affects the soundness of wet weld uh, as a matter of fact american welding society they have uh they have a code now it's it's called d3.6 and it's the underwater welding code and that was a specification for a lot of years and they specify wet welds in a couple of different categories so or underwater welds so a, a class a weld is the equivalent of the same strength or whatever that you would find in a dry topside weld. No wet welds are class A. Wet welds are generally class B. Now, they're less stringent in their mechanical properties. So and what that comes from is because obviously the, the weld metal quenches so quickly that the material becomes brittle. It gets really hard and brittle, and it doesn't have the same fatigue strength or ductility as the, even the same rod welded dry in the habitat or topside. So uh, then they have class C welds, and that would be like class C weld is just maybe putting an anode on a dock or something, something that maybe nobody really cares about. And then there's a class O weld. I'm not too familiar with class O, but I think basically a class O is when there's special requirements from the customer. They may add a little more stringent requirements in there or something, but but anyways, class A and class B. So to my knowledge, there's never been a class A wet weld completed. It's kind of like, to me, it's kind of like the holy grail of underwater welding. It's the class A wet weld. Now, you can Google that, and there's a couple people that claim to have had it, but they don't put the whole story behind their destructive testing results. So like uh, hardness is a big issue and elongation in the well deposit and bin test there it's kind of hard to to pass a class a bin test with a wet weld since you brought testing up with that that's a good point to a segue there to get into the how to be certified and all that stuff with the different welds that you have down there 
it, you pretty much would be the same as what we would do it on land, right? You're, you're going to take a test in the environment that you're going to be welded in pretty much and then bring in it. In your case, it'd be you take a test underwater and then would you bring that test sample then obviously out of the water and then send it to the lab and have it tested to the uh, D3.6 code then? Yeah, that's correct. So our company and, you know, most of the larger underwater welding companies, I mean, there's probably a handful in the, in the States, but we would have testing tanks. So we have a, a tank in our yard at our shop that's, uh, say, 35 feet deep. It's about about 12 foot in diameter. There's a habitat on bottom and there's a couple of wet welding stations at bottom. And uh, to become a certified underwater welder, you know, really that's going to happen for you at your employer. So we have, hell, we probably have 50 different welding procedures at Phoenix alone. And, uh, you know, of course, none of these are pre-qualified at all. So at some point, myself or some of my colleagues have, have done the procedure welding plates and, you know, in the tank, whether it be wet, or in the habitat and essentially you know you finish the plate and you bring it out when you say it's done uh, it goes through a certain a few different levels of non-destructive testing in-house before it even goes out for x-ray so what you know normally what we do is if it's a, if it's a wet weld what's going to happen is if it's a phoretic weld we're going to do a mag particle inspection and a visual inspection in-house and that'll be one of your your co-workers and you know surprisingly it might be your best friend and we're pretty stringent on each other and we try to keep the quality level pretty high and if you pass the in-house testing usually it goes straight out to a, an x-ray laboratory if it passes x-ray it'll go to a destructive testing laboratory and Depending on whatever the test is, if it's a procedure plate, obviously it's going to get tinsel, tinsel test, hardness testing, bin testing, macros, and the whole nine yards. If it's qualification testing, it's most likely going to be x-rays and bin testing. And uh, this contract we have with the Navy, we are required to have it's either eight or ten what we call key welder divers. So a key welder diver for our contract is a guy who has passed all the minimum requirements in terms of uh, weld tests. Right now, that stands at 18 different underwater welding tests. Mm. And, uh, and that's counting position also. So, like, let's take, for example, we do a lot of wet welding with a nickel electrode. Basically, that's uh, it's just a nickel electrode. That's the same thing you would find guys in power plants resurfacing flange faces or, or doing whatever. You know, it, it has an underwater coating on the flux to keep the flux dry for a certain amount of time while you're using it underwater. You get really good mechanical properties with a nickel weld, so we, we end up using that a lot. What you don't get, kind of the hindrance of a nickel weld, is if you put nickel weld, let's say, on a ship hull, what happens is the ship hull now becomes the less noble material in the weld and corrosion will start eating away at the ship hull instead of the nickel. So if we use that on a ship, eventually get into dry docks, they'll cut that nickel weld out and replace whatever it may be with like a, you know, a topside dry weld in, you know, in the shipyard. So <laughs> we also do a lot of, uh, you know, wet, mild steel welding. So that would be, you know, I want to say like a... 70-10 rod, you know, like a hippie rod with a coating on it, or 70-24, something like that. You know, we, we buy them off the shelf, but Broco is, is a, one of the largest manufacturers of wet welding rods. It's called Broco. They also make exothermic underwater cutting rods and things like that. And, and so we'll test in the 2G, 3G, 4G for various rods, and then we'll use those same rods with dissimilar metals. So like maybe A36 to HY80 or HY80 to HSLA material. We also do a bunch of different materials and different rods in the habitats and like uh, copper nickel and we do some TIG welding in the habitat. We've actually done uh, underwater aluminum welding here not too long ago. One of my more favorite procedure developments I've been a part of. And then we'll do like, so just take, for example, that aluminum weld, like those ships that were fixed, and I think they're LSTs or something, I can't remember what they're called, but the framework, I believe, is 6061. The hull is 5083. So we do three different procedures. So we'll do 5083 to 5083, 5083 to 6061, and 6061 to 6061. So these 
basically what I'm getting at is these minimum requirement tests start to really add up because of all the different materials we may run into. So if you're a key welder diver, the thought process is we can just call this guy, they can send this guy out on the road, and he's ready and qualified to weld pretty much anything right. we're coming in contact with. And then we still, like, really on a, about every two years, we'll run into something. They'll come up with some new thing they want to add to a ship, or there's something I'll run into offshore in the in the oil patch and might be some weird material or and we'll have to take tests for it and uh and then you know we get out on these jobs too and let's take for example what i did today i went to habitat and my dive today was to take what we call confirmation test plates so even though i have a a folder back in the office that's got you know I've, i don't know i've got like uh maybe 30 different certs with phoenix i still get out on the job site and i'm made to take a 3f and a 4f fillet t-plate down in the habitat and uh that's not only to confirm that the equipment is working correctly but uh you know they scrutinize the hell out of me on that stuff too so you know today it, it went okay i passed but man it was like it, it took everything i had to get it in there that same like i was saying earlier that same rod top side same position same material same everything same amps ran a bead i could have done it with my eyes closed and i get down in the habitat and it just man it took everything i had to get it in there you know and i've hmm. been doing this a long time so today was it was a tough day but I, I got through there so i can have a laugh at the end of it you know All right so do they make you qualify before each dive or each each job i should say so in the oil field, historically, the companies want to know, they want you to qualify pre-job. So they don't necessarily always recognize your existing certification. And a lot of times in the offshore oil field, the prevailing test for wet welding is the 5F. So that's uh, pipe to plate and usually in the vertical and overhead position, so the 5 position. Uh, and the dry welding test is going to be a 6GR in the habitat. So in general, offshore, you're going to find yourself testing a lot of times before the job. On the Navy side of things, on the ship's husbandry side of things, they sort of recognize the fact that the test you took to get that cert was, was pretty damn hard, and they'll kind of recognize those certifications. But we have to do what we call maintenance, and, you know, most welders have to do this. To stay qualified under our NAVC Navy contract, we have to do what we call maintenance welding and that's every three months we have to burn so many rods and we have to document it. And, you know, for a guy like me that spends most of his time in the oil patch, it can actually be a little worrisome to do all these different welds every three months because I might be hooked up for four months with one job and somehow I got to get out on the back deck and out of the dive shack and run some beads and, and uh, turn that paperwork in. So it's it's a little bit to keep up with for sure. So so it's not necessarily that you have to run beads underwater. It's just you got to run that process X amount of pounds or X amount of hours. Right. And that that's that's a good point. Like it's mostly process. So like if I go out and I and, and yeah, you, you do it for the wet stuff. You're supposed to do it underwater. So we'll go hop in the tank. And, uh, you know, we might get a bunch of guys together that are come and do on their maintenance and get a couple guys to run the tank and we'll hop in there and each burn a handful of rods. If you do shielded metal arc welding, that's going to cross qualify or cross maintain you for a number of different rods. And, uh, you might have to jump up in the habitat, do and do, do you take welding or do your, your, uh, flux core arc welding or whatever it may be. But yeah, for sure. At least we can just do it by process. Okay, so it sounds like your that your code is a little bit more stringent than I guess what I weld to. I mean, technically, I, from what I've understood and everything, everything, it's every six months as long as you weld to the process every six months under like the D one point one, one dot one, whatever you want to say it. Where you guys are every three months, so that's a little bit more stringent. Stringent plus you got to get on the water. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, and that's a, a military standard. We're usually using for uh, out of NAVC. We're using mill standard 1689, I believe it is, for surface ships, and uh, that basically covers all the welding you might do on any kind of surface vessel for the U.S. Navy. And I think 1688 is submarines. And we do some submarine work, uh, a little bit of welding on submarines, and more more sort of construction work and changing out components on submarines, but. Let's see what else. And, you know, like all the procedural stuff is 
mostly everything we work to is the mill standard. And in general, that stuff will be more stringent, but not always. Like, uh, there's some stuff, in, obviously, in, in D11 that can be pretty stringent. You know, you really got to have your stuff together to get it right. So it's kind of tough because, like I, like I said before, I exist in both these worlds. Not only do I work offshore in the, in the oil field, but doing uh, Navy vessel repair. And then occasionally I do commercial ship repair. And they're all three completely different worlds. So, you know, I got to kind of hop around in there and, you know, the scrutiny behind the Navy stuff, you know, I, let's take, for example, last year, beginning of the year, they flew me, I live in New Orleans and they flew me from New Orleans to San Diego and I made literally a half inch of weld and then they flew me back. <laughs> and I was talking to the uh, the NAVC representative about that yesterday, and he said the paperwork for that job lasted for three months after I left. Now, that, that sort of thing wow. in the Gulf of Mexico, man, they want to turn that well back on, you know? So you even way less scrutinized than, say, commercial ship's husbandry. It's like, you know, just get that insert in there, get it welded. Yeah, it looks good, man. Let's go. You know, that sort of thing. So, you know, you, you got to be able to kind of operate and not let these things sort of overlap. But and in some ways, you know, you learn a lot in one industry that helps you out in another one. So it's it's cool for me because I get to like mix, you know, I get to mix things up quite a bit. If I get bored being out in the golf for a year straight, there's always a Navy job at a nice hotel waiting for me around the corner at some point. <laughs> cool. I dealt with the D-17 dot one code for aviation aerospace stuff and it came from two mill standards so and i was on that committee for a while and so you had all these guys in that committee they come from the mill standard world and i remember the welding every 90 days you had to either you had to either in the mill standard 1595a you had to either weld document weld every 90 days and then you could certify every five years or you could certify every two years and with no requirement to document welding activity every every 90 days. So we went with the two year option. But then D17 came and you still have some options there. But you also ha you can go just like D11. And, and as long as you're welding every six months, you never have to recertify, which is kind of strange. If you think about it, if you think about if I strike an arc on some, you know, 17-7 stainless that ups my qualification, that renews my qualification for magnesium as well, which is, you know, totally two totally different skill sets. You know, you could, but it is what it is. The, the company itself always had the leeway of going more stringent if they wanted to, you know. Right. And you know that like sometimes the maintenance doesn't really, what you can do that's considered true maintenance isn't necessarily going to ready you for what you need to do on some jobs and like let's take for example today like the last work and dive i had was probably two years ago i spent most of my time in the shack or supervising guys in the water now and, and now i'm out on this job as a diver which is great in some ways because i don't have the responsibility that I, I normally do and i can have some fun but and i was really worried about getting that weld in there today you know so i dropped the hood topside and practice and really really did my maintenance for real and, and got some practice in it. I'm glad I did because, man, it was it was tough when I got in that habitat today and started trying to lay them beads in there, you know? Mm -hmm. What um, kind of equipment do you use for, like, welding equipment? Well, we – okay, so most welding machines that we're using – for underwater welding are going to be inverters. We just love inverters. We love the digital readout. You know, the guys love to mess with that inductance knob. And me personally, the less knobs and less buttons and lights on a welding machine, the more I'm going to like it. But, you know, we, we in general, we use inverters. The welding stinger is specialized custom underwater welding stingers. And I actually have a very good friend. Uh, his name is Ken, and he manufactures his own welding stingers. And uh, usually how they're, they're made, they're the welding lead. You know, we use 2 ot for the most part. They're potted into the handle of the stinger. So it's a dry connection, and that usually goes up to uh, just a copper contact. And what we'll do is take a copper bolt and that will normally screw into the body of the stinger. And that's like, we call that your contact bolt. And cause that'll work the electrolysis of welding in the water. That'll, it'll wear that out. And eventually that stinger, it won't clamp down enough. And you have to take that bolt out, put a new contact bolt in, screw that stinger head back in there. Um, let's see what else. So, and then a lot of, you know, obviously, like I said before, we use pneumatic tools and hydraulic tools so that that's the thing about tenders you know you really to keep these guys working underwater you have to really have a knowledge you start to gain a knowledge about how uh, hydraulic 
units work. You have to really start to get up on being a, a mechanic a little bit because, you know, you're out in these remote locations and you've got these diesel compressors and hydraulic units that might be diesel operated or, or run off a generator. And if they go down, you, you may not necessarily just be able to get a new one out there right away. So I'm trying to think if there's any real uh, like specialized tools that we use. So, you know, I know one cool one I, I'll tell you about is uh, when we put a habitat on, we have to do what we call templating. So the surface that seals against the rudder or the hull or the platform leg, whatever it may be, it needs to be templated so it matches perfectly and that flange fits up just right. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those things where like it's a bunch of little pins and you stick yeah. your hand in there, you stick mm-hmm. your face, whatever. Well, that's essentially what we use. All these pins, they're the same. They're like on the same pattern, same shape and size as the flange that will eventually made up against the surface. And we'll level the body of that thing and get it just right. And then we'll push it up against there. And then we lock all those pins in place, send that thing up topside. And then we transfer those measurements to the flange. And then once we've cut it, you know, we'll add our... Uh, our flange material and rubber on you you bring that back down and it'll fit perfect so even like a little one inch bump in the hall or even you know sometimes there might be a just a weld seam that you're going over top and there's like a proud weld reinforcement on there you know you're, you're going to see that in your contour fit up so that's one really cool thing we do now you said you do uh tig welding in the chambers Yes. Personally, I've only ever been on one underwater TIG welding job. We basically, it was, I think it was just a mild steel. It was a big, um, it was offshore. And what it was were these risers that come up off the seafloor. Risers, basically just an oil or gas pipe that goes vertically and it rises up. And that they, we call them risers. And on these risers, this thing was in such deep water that they had these big sort of upside down cans that had nitrogen in them. And what they did was add buoyancy to these risers to take some of the weight off of them. Uh, so it wouldn't be such a, you know, a strain on the platform holding them up. Well, some of these things were cracking. So we had to go in and, and put new collars that connected the domes that held the nitrogen to the riser itself. And we take the root and the hot pass. And that was because we... Basically, I couldn't do a full pin weld with a backing just because of the way the uh, the joint geometry was. So they wanted to make sure that we got a very good root and hot pass it, and so they chose TIG welding. TIG welding is not really my thing. I like to look at the pictures the guys put on Instagram, the stainless with the different colors and everything. But in terms of the type of welding I do, I, I'm not I'm not really too into it. I like kind of the big rod laying down a lot of metal, and it's maybe a little too detail oriented for me to get into, you know. Yeah. I was curious if you noticed any difference on how it reacted. Like you're saying, the stick welding, the puddle reacts differently. I'm curious if the TIG welding puddle would react differently and and like how the gas would flow with the different pressures and things along those lines. Well, you have to compensate just in terms of shielding gas. You have to compensate for what we call over bottom pressure. So let's say you're at, uh, you're at, you're working at, 33 feet that's one atmosphere and that's like you know 14.7 psi or whatever so uh so if you need to send down a certain pressure to your tig torch or even your your gun you have to calculate how much bottom pressure is at the working depth and sometimes on these jobs we can go up and down so you're constantly calculating how much that pressure is and to see the same sort of flow and pressure that you would need topside you have to bump it up that much uh you know you have to add that over bottom pressure Hmm. but as far as the tig welding the arc characteristics i didn't necessarily notice that much of a difference on that job and i think we're we were only welding maybe at like 15 feet or something so there probably wasn't that much effect in general but at the same time, like I'm probably not good enough a TIG welder that I would really notice if there was something that different, you know, you know, the small nuances of it, it'd probably be lost on me, you know. If you're MIG welding under there in your chamber, then all all the wire and everything's coming down that umbilical. Well, so when we did the uh, the aluminum procedures, what we used was, and it's actually, I don't know, so if anybody's interested, they can search uh, Lincoln and underwater aluminum welding, and you'll see me and a couple of my buddies there, and we did uh, hyperbaric aluminum welding, like I was talking about earlier, and uh, what we used was a push-pull gun that had a 50-foot lead on it, so, I, you know, we're going to work on these ships that don't draft much more than 12 feet or something like that, so We, you know, we think we can get down to the depth that we need with just that 50 feet, but pushing and pulling aluminum wire even 15 feet 
has its own problems. So there was a lot of little problems we had to figure out when we were setting that procedure. Big well and underwater, it's just like not, it's not something that is meant to be, you know, so. <laughs> so I want to touch on one. Everybody that ever talks about underwater welders or commercial divers, you touched on earlier is the pay. Can you give us a rough idea, realistically, what you can expect to make from a beginner to an experienced diver? Yeah, sure. Um, it's not uncommon for an offshore diver to make six figures a year consistently. Um, I've got a friend who his best year was 300000 plus. I got a number of friends that on average for a number of years were making about 180 to 200 a year. This is usually sat diving. So sat diving is it's short for saturation diving. And in general, you might you could look at making a thousand bucks a day doing that. You know, that's going to be especially right now, that's going to be the top of your pay scale. And it's also feast or famines, like I said earlier. So if there's if there's a lot of work and you're willing to go after it and stay offshore for a long time, you, you can make a lot of money. If you're an entry level guy, you know, if you're a tender, you could easily make 60 grand in a year as a tender now. It's kind of tough for me saying this because I know I got I got buddies of mine that are barely scraping by right now. Price of oil is tanked and, and there's not a whole lot of work. But on an average year, tender can make a good fifty to sixty thousand. Uh, if they really are lucky, you know they're they're going to push eighty or whatever. You break out, you might drop down a little bit because you're not going to be the first guy to get the call because before you broke out, you might have been running the deck and you were very important to the supervisor because, you know, you were his eyes out on the deck and sort of running things and making sure everything was going right. As soon as you break out, you know, you're you're now at the bottom of the pack. So you, you might drop off a little bit. But on average, I think uh, it's just hard to say. I'm, I'm saying six figures, 100, you know, guy, five years, four years, out of dive school, it's not uncommon to be looking at 100 or 150K. Right. I really want to stress what you said there about feast or famine. You know, the right. misconception is out there online. I see it all the time on the Facebook groups and forums. Oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to, 18 years old, go to diving school and I'm going to come out, I'm going to make 250 grand a year. And it's like, no, nah, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> right. And then, of course, you got to, you know, you take into account what I was saying earlier about the attrition rate. These are guys that, you know, they keep their head down and they work hard and they, they listen. And, and it's like any other job, you know, you uh, you start making yourself useful and, and people like you and the supervisor is going to he's going to give you a call. You know, you're going to be on the short list. And, and if you are, you, you really can make a lot of good money. You know, you can make solid money. That is true. Like nobody's getting rich. Definitely nobody's getting rich, and it's not like, you know, you're not going to make the money a doctor is going to make necessarily. But for a guy like me who barely made it out of high school and grew up, you know, in, in the shop, I, I do all right. And it's been a, a very good career choice for me, you know, and I got a nice little house and my family's fed. And I'm really happy where I'm at. So mm -hmm. that's that's at the end of the day, that's what's important. At least that's what's as important to us. That's right. And the other big thing that I always hear about the underwater stuff is the health concerns is it actually true that it like taking on all the bottom pressures and decompressing and compressing all that is that shorten your lifespan or is that just kind of a myth or is it just the dangers I, no, of it yeah, in, I, in general I, I would say that's a that's a misconception um if you think about it it's, it can be a very physical job so one way of looking at it is that it, you know in, in a lot of ways it can keep you in shape you know, if yeah. you're working a lot, you know, it's a, it can be extremely, extremely physical job. Let's, let, you know, take, for example, this job I'm on right now, minimum bottom time is, is five hours. And that's that's five hours without a drink of water. That's five hours of uh, hard manual labor. And even though it may not, you know, average work, <laughs> average work day is eight hours, but this is five hours with hatting up and, and you stay hooked up and until the day's over and, and all this is uh everything is overhead you know you're working on a ship so everything you're doing is up above you so you're you're pulling yourself around on ropes and you're you're supporting your weight the whole time and you know obviously you weigh a little bit less and you, and you can adjust all that but it, it can get really physical and uh as far as effects on your body in terms of pressure now you know, like my, my deepest dive is about 500 feet. When you start getting down around like 250, 300, you can feel the weight of the water and you can kind of feel the effect it's having on you. And if you're at 500 feet and you're looking at a five hour dive, you know, you're in sat, which means your body is totally saturated with nitrogen. Uh, 
and you're going to stay at this pressure for 35 days, you know, mm. on average, uh, you, you know, we live in the, live in the chamber top side, you know, in the sat system and, uh, you stay at this depth. Well, that, you know, you stand up and you can feel every bone in your body, every joint in your body pop and crack. And, and that sort of stuff, you know, it can, people say it'll, it can press the lubricant out from in between your joints. But, you know, you regain all that, you know, eventually you kind of, you get all that stuff back and, and you just got to pace yourself when you're at it. If you go down there and you're at a deep depth and you're feeling it and you get out and, and you just try to hit it, you know, obviously you're going to hit it hard, but if you go too hard in your first hour, you're looking at another four hours of work down there and there's a $150,000 a day boat up there wondering, you know, hey, there ain't time to be tired, man. You got to get some stuff done, you know. Take a break uh, in the other 20 hours when you're waiting to get back in the water. So now, when you compress to those depths, how long does it take to decompress from that Uh, in general? I think, you know, generally people say about a day per 100 feet in terms of sats. So, like, longest sat I ever did, you know, I've only done a, only made about a half a dozen runs. And uh, they were all around about 20 to 30 days. And the one I did that was at 500 feet, I spent about, I think it was about six days uh, decompressing. Hmm. So, yeah, you're in this little and you're in this little tiny room, and you come up about a foot every hour, whatever it is, you know. And it's just like, and those last three feet are just excruciating. They're like, it's like the longest time of your life, you know. And you just want to pop that hatch open and get out. And it's got to wait, you know. You just you're still looking at another couple of days of coming up, and you may only be at 25 feet or something like that. So I I, I want to understand this a little bit better, and then those that are listening, maybe they don't understand that. So when you go dive down 500 feet and you come back up, you get inside that chamber or whatever that it is, and you're there for how many ever days decompressing then? Well, so in saturation diving, we call it a, a system, right? The system is on the top deck. Maybe it's on the back deck of a boat or it's on the back deck of a, or on the deck of the barge. Sat systems are usually, they'll call them 12 man sat or an 8 man sat or 10 man sat. And that, that kind of represents the size of them. Most of the ones I were in, we had like six guys in them at one time. And you're in there with your bell partner. And your bell partner is the guy that call it locking out of the system. So you basically you open a hatch, two hatches, you climb into what's called the bell. You and your bell partner, you close that hatch and then, uh, when the pressures are equalized, we call it going for seal. You tell the guys running at topside, you know, they got radio comms with you in the bell. And this is all happening on the deck of the boat. But you may be at a pressure that's equivalent to, say, four, 300 feet or whatever it may be. And that bell disconnects from the system. And then there's usually a handling frame or crane or whatever it may be and it's usually a handling frame and then that bell it'll move away from the system and you'll drop down most of the time through what's called a moon pool and that's just a hole in the in the center of the vessel that's open to the sea and the bell will slowly descend through the moon pole into the water and then you'll go down and down and down till you get to your working depth essentially but once the depth of the water pressure when that depth and water pressure equals whatever the pressure is inside of the system and inside the bell, you can open the hatch. And you just open that hatch, and you put on your diving helmet. One of you goes out. You, you help your bell partner get out of the system. He goes down to what's called the clump weight, and it's just kind of a staging thing below you. And you put on your, your emergency gas bottle, and you grab your tools, and you go to work. Usually, we call that a lockout. And that, that's usually around anywhere from four to five hours, depending on what you're doing. Uh, once you're done with your run, you, you come back to the bell. Your bell partner, he comes up on your, your dive hose. And he's coiling it. And then you come switch hats. You clean the hat out. You know, you would, like, take a betadine or whatever. It's going to disinfect. And you put the same hat on. And then you go and you go do your work for four to five hours. And then there's nothing better than, like, once everybody's back in there, you close the hatch back up. And they pick you back up to the boat. You reverse the process. You come lock back onto the system. Once the pressure is equalized, the hatch is open, and you get to go in there and take a shower and put your sweatpants on and pretty much hang out for 20 hours. And uh, mm. some systems are more comfortable than others. You know, if you get in a new system, you know, you live in a pretty okay. Uh, some companies allow you to have uh, maybe a, like a laptop in there or your iPhone or whatever. So, you, you know, if there's if you get a Wi-Fi service to the back deck, you can kind of text your wife or whomever and, 
look at Instagram and stuff like that. But some companies there, you know, they don't want you to have anything like that in the system. And, you know, especially if it's like the, whatever those batteries are that, that catch fire, I can't remember what they're called, but, uh, the lithium ions or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. If you, yeah. If you got something bad. like that in there, man, the last thing you want to have is fire in the damn sat system. So I've heard of companies that will issue kind of intrinsically safe laptops and things like that gadgets for guys to have inside the system to make life a little bit better. But you think about it, man, you're in there for, you can be in there for over a month and not a whole lot to do to pass the time except play cards and dominoes and read books and stuff like that. And you really look forward to that, that lockout. Cause it, you know, I've, I've been a, in a system that I couldn't stand up straight in. It was so small that, you know, I kind of was hunched over for 30 days and so that's not for everybody, but you can make a good you can make a good day rate doing that, and that's sort of what a lot of guys aspire to in oil field diving is is being a sat diver and being one of those guys. And usually, if you know if you can say you kind of you done some sat, it's not the end all be all. It doesn't mean that you're a great diver or whatever. But for the most part, you, you know your tickets punch. You know you can really say you're a journeyman and and you've kind of been there and done that and. You've probably done just about everything in diving once you've made it in the sat. You know, obviously there's exceptions to every rule, but for the most part, guys aspire to be be a sat diver. And you know, even my short time in sat, I'm, I'm very proud of that. I'll tell anybody who listens about it. <laughs> Bragging rights, man. Uh, yeah, That's yeah. Right. Well, you you earned it. So if you're if you're claustrophobic, sat diving is not for you then. Yeah, probably not. But like, probably in in general diving, yeah. if you're claustrophobic, <laughs> and and you know, I was. I was actually pretty claustrophobic, even as a boiler maker. You know, like I'd get in these mud mud drums and steam drums, and I'd have to kind of get halfway through the hatch and think twice about it and egg myself on. Once I got in there, usually I was all right. And, uh, but I've been in some places in diving, man. I've been in some really really hairy stuff, and you kind of forget about being claustrophobic. You know, you you kind of. I guess I could say I'm kind of cured. I've been in some stuff that's just cured me. Like I made it out of that. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> nothing really phases me in terms of tight places now. But to kind of go back to, uh, we were talking about pay earlier. So there's a few different ways we get paid. You know, obviously you have your hourly rate. And when you go offshore, you, you get a minimum 12 hours. And so, and everything over eight is time and a half. And that is pretty much the rule offshore. That's that's basically the way we all get paid. Even, you know, people that aren't divers, they they pretty much get paid the same way so minimum 12 hour day of pay whether you work it or not you might be might be too rough to work and and you're just kind of laying in your rack watching movies and reading books you're going to get your you're going to get your 12 hours and if it's over eight hours you're usually going to your rate's going to turn in time and a half over eight now in diving we get what's called depth pay and that's it is what it sounds like you know the deeper you go the more money you make it starts at 50 feet so if you make a dive to 51 feet you get a dollar. 52 feet, you get two dollars. When you get up to 100 feet, it graduates. So a foot is worth more money the deeper you go, if that makes sense. Hmm. Um, and when times are, when the oil field's kicking and divers are in high demand, they'll start paying that one foot at zero to one foot, you know. Uh, but that's one of the first things, like as soon as the kind of work starts to dry up, that's one of the first things they go. They start not paying you from zero to 50 foot and that's kind of a thing we all like. I mean, you can drown in the bathtub, so, you know, why is it not worth any money to go diving at 10 feet? And it's, we should be getting that pay, you know? But Right, that, that, that makes sense. Is, you know? So yeah. is that is that pay because of the risk involved? I mean, that, cause that I guess that kind of goes back to Roy's comment there about, you know, life expectancy maybe being shortened. Is that for the risk involved in it overall or the, or the general maybe a life expectancy re- reduction or – or, or well, what? I would I would say it's more it's more of a direct risk factor. Kind of the slang term that we we use. We a lot of guys say that you know in terms of depth pay, we're paid for decompression and not for depth. So what that means is like the deeper you go, the longer you spend in decompression. So let's say you go to well, I'm just take a depth at random here. Let's, you go to 250 feet. Well, if you go to 250 feet. And you're breathing a mixed gas. This is just a surface dive. Uh, you know, you're, you're breathing uh, a certain amount of oxygen will be in the mix, and the rest will be helium. That helium takes a long time to off gas out of your system. So at 250 feet on a surface dive, probably only going to have about 28 minutes of bottom time allowed to go get something done. 
And bottom time starts when you say leave and surface. So as soon as you get in the water and you start descending down to the working depth, you tell your, you tell the soup, hey, I'm, I'm leaving surface. And you take off. And most people at 100 feet, on a, we call them gas dives, these like mixed gas dives where there's helium and, and oxygen, uh, you would stop at 100. And then they switch you from air, which is being pumped from the surface. They switch you over to this mixed gas, which is being held in uh, high pressure cylinders. You check everything. And this happens over just a few seconds. You check everything's okay. And then you take off the bottom. And that's all in your bottom time. So by the time you get to 250 feet, that might take you three minutes or something like that. And, you know, you've only got another however many minutes to, to get something done. And then we don't, we try not like, I'm not necessarily going to run you right up to that 27 minute mark or whatever that bottom time mark may be, because I'm going to bank a couple of minutes for a safety factor. You know, if mm-hmm. you get hung up on bottom, you don't want a guy to miss decompression and have to go on a treatment table and possibly be out of diving for a little while, just because you, you want him to get that last shackle pin in or something, you know? So, you know, you give yourself a few, maybe a minute or two of, in your back pocket to kind of make sure nothing's unsafe is going to happen. Well, on that dive, you may have to decompress in the water for an hour or more. So what that means is you would come up slowly, you know, a very controlled ascent, and you're usually coming up in a stage or, or a, you know, a stage connected to a winch topside, or, or it may just be a downline, just a rope connected from the boat to the worksite. And you're climbing up real slow, and I'm tracking your whoever the supervisor may be. We have a gauge that can read in feet, so I can I can see how deep the guy is. And then you put that hose that that gauge is connected to, and we call those a pneumo gauge, or uh, actually called a correct term is a caisson gauge, but uh, slang is a pneumo gauge. And so you put that hose at your chest, and you just you have a certain ascent rate you have to follow, and and the deeper you go, the longer it takes to get out. And so we say that we're paid for the decompression because that's not really the fun. The fun is going down and working and getting down deep in the mud and throwing a flange together or something like that. So, hmm. And after all that's done, you, you get out of the water and you go into a decompression chamber. You can be in there for upwards of four to five hours just for that 27 minutes of time you spent working on bottom. So, But now you got out of the water – and you walked over to the chamber and got into that chamber. How does that work? That, that's the part I don't get. Well, we call that a the chamber. We call it a deck decompression chamber. And they usually have what we, uh, we call them locks. And they're double locks. So if you can imagine like a, about a four-foot diameter pipe laid on its side that's usually around 13 feet long. And I want to say they're usually about an inch wall thickness. And... Inside, you know, there's a there's a big, heavy, there's steel, and it's usually a really big, heavy, circular door with an O-ring on one end of it, and the diver would come out of the water, and, and he, you come out of the water, and you, you get on deck, and you have a certain amount of time from your last water stop. You know, if, you, if you're coming up out of the water, and you have to stop, say, every 10 feet and stay for a certain time, and, you know, that's my job. I, I'll track these guys and make sure they're following this. And uh, your last water stop, if it's a gas dive, it's usually going to be at 40 feet deep. And if it's a air dive, if you're just breathing compressed air, it's usually going to be at 30 feet. Well, you have a minute to go from your last stop to the surface. So you'd leave your water stop. You come up, you get to the ladder, or you're riding up on the stage. And then you have a certain amount of time, and it's different whether it's a gas dive or an air dive. It's shorter if it's a gas dive. You might have just two minutes to get from the stage or the ladder into the chamber and then down to the equivalent of 50 foot of depth in the chamber. So what happens is you go get in that, you just strip down naked. And there, there might be, there might be 50 people out on deck and cameras on you and, and you got to like kind of lose that shyness pretty quick. You just strip down buck naked, hop in that chamber with a towel and a bottle of water, a tender on the outside will pull that, port door, hard closed, you have a what we call a crossover valve. And you'll open that valve, and the pressure that's in the inner lock will start to equalize with the pressure in the, the outer lock, which is what you are currently in. If we've done it right, that pressure will equalize at that 50-foot depth. So once that you reach that equalized depth, you can open up the inner lock door, and you go get inside of there, 
You close that lock, you tell the tender running the chamber on the outside to hit it, and he'll dump the pressure in the outer lock, and then that'll create a seal on the inner lock door. And now you've got to stay in there for however long your dive table tells you to. And so, and then you breathe 100% oxygen in there for certain periods of time, and you come up, you know, gradually at certain depths. So usually you start at 50, you breathe like 10 minutes of pure O2, you take a five minute break and you go to 40 and then you would breathe O2 for five minutes, take a one minute break, breathe O2 for five minutes and so on. And then the last bit is 40 to surface and that usually takes about 10 minutes. And there's a tender outside and uh, they're watching your depth and, and keep an eye on you. You know, decompression sickness is a, is a very serious thing, and it happens a lot. You know, I've actually been bent, um, I want to say, two times technically and a few other times, but, you know, we'll just keep that between us. I just kind of, you know, it was a couple times I just walked them off. So, <laughs> uh, And this is something that you pretty much would have to do every single day? Yeah, so if you're... Uh, Jeez. If you're air diving, air diving, you can do it legally in the Gulf of Mexico down to 220 feet. You know, that's a, it's a Coast Guard regulation that 220 feet is the deepest that you can breathe compressed air. And the reason why is because the oxygen, an elevated amount of oxygen, like it can make you go into convulsion. You know, enough science has been done on this where if you're breathing air much deeper than that, the oxygen concentration is and partial pressure is a little bit it's high enough to make you go into convulsion so that's the reason why you got to stop breathing air at 220 and you start breathing mixed gas deeper than that you can do mixed gas surface dives down to 300 feet and to go any deeper on mixed gas surface dive you have to get a waiver from the coast guard the coast guard kind of regulates us out there they are following what's called the code of federal regulation you know they're pretty vague they're not like really that strict i mean there's there's some pretty good rules like they've definitely put some thought into how deep you can dive air and gas and sort of the working conditions you can be in but yeah so back to the question with air you can do that every day hmm. if you're diving air you can do it every single day but if you're on a long job even with air you got to kind of watch guys because you know those bubbles they can just keep building and building and a month from now you know you might have a guy getting bent just diving every single day now with gas you have to take a day off i think every i can't remember off the top of my head but maybe every fifth day or something like that but uh it's probably there's going to be some dive other dive supervisors out there yelling at me because i can't remember right off the top of my head but anyways yeah you got to take a day off sort of let those bubbles that are accumulating in your system work their way out and it's all i'm just sitting here so it's so interesting i mean it's something that i'll probably never get to do um I've told these guys it'd be fun to jump into the tank and, and practice once, mm-hmm. but I would never want to go out to the golf. But it's just like so interesting. It's like, wow, totally different. I mean, we we worry about going out to our, our shops and just firing up everything and completing our weld and going in, take a shower and go to bed. And you got all this other stuff to worry about. It's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not going to lie, guys. You know, I, I've spent my bottom time and this is not uncommon what i'm about to say but my bottom time can be tallied in years of my life you know i've spent hell i'm probably at like six or well maybe probably five years of my life has been literally spent underwater and i still to this day man i'll go out right now and go snorkeling and look at fish it just never gets old you know and i can't wait to take my little young kids out and have their first experience in the water and it's and i'm around a lot of guys that are surfers and just watermen in general you know and it's it's a lifestyle for sure and and i really enjoy it and it's just i mean it's it can be a job it's a job like any other but let me let me give you an example man i was when i was over at a, the other company i was working for offshore i was having a particularly tough day and i just was not happy it's kind of depressed one day and i went to go make a dive and as soon as I hit the water, I, I couldn't have, it like completely changed me. I was happy. I was energetic. And it was like a 180 degree turn. I just never forget the way that affected me that time. Well, listening to everything that you're talking about, and, and I'm pretty sure all the listeners would agree with what you had said before. You, you really need to be a diver first and a welder mm-hmm. second because there's so much more to it with the diving end of it. The welding is just welding. But, you know, with 
dealing with all the decompressions and knowing everything there has to know about diving. Like you said, you can you can make a diver a welder, but it's hard to make a welder a diver. You know, uh, one of my mentors kind of told me that it's uh, you're a diver first and a welder second. And that's not to discount the welding side of things by any means. I mean, we get into some pretty hardcore stuff and I, I love welding. I mean, that's that's my first love in terms of work. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just fascinated by metallurgy and, and destructive testing and ND, NDE and all that stuff. But if you can't set the habitat, you know, if you can't get that thing set in a reasonable amount of time, you're really not that valuable to the project, you know. If you're the type of person that just you can put the prettiest bead in the world and you go down, but you really can't, you know, we can't kind of rely on you to transfer the load from the crane and, and sort of stay on top of how things are going underwater and, and report back and kind of tell us what's next. And, you know, there's a good chance we're going to choose that guy who's or that that girl's whose beads may not be the prettiest. That cap on that weld might not be the best, but. She may have got that habitat on there and in record amount of time and, and got everything set up. You know, it's it's all about production. There's the whole production is it's the whole job, you know. It's it's not just that weld. Now, now don't don't get me wrong though, that weld is why you're there, but there's so many facets to it, you know, and you really need to that's one thing I would tell the younger guys kinda of coming in, especially if they're welders and that's what they want to do is read up on standard rigging practices and and non-destructive testing, and, and obviously what's really important, you want to know how to run life support equipment on the job and things like that, and there's just so much to it. And uh, if you kind of get tunnel vision and all you're thinking about is welding, then you, you might be selling yourself short. Hmm. Since you brought up the uh, life support, you know there are a lot of people that talk about, and I've heard stories as well online about what can go wrong and just the, the complete dangers. Can you share, or have you been in any experiences like that that you're willing to share, um, the actual dangers uh, of diving, of diving in general, not necessarily welding, but just diving in general? I know you talked about the bubbles and stuff like that already, and I've heard stories, I'm sure all of us had, of people dying from, from different aspects of diving Um, see if you have anything to to share with that as well yeah sure uh man there's a lot of different ways to go in this business that's for sure and uh (laughs) when i first got into it you know down in the old patch there was one to two guys dying out in the gulf every year and you know I, i know that that number only goes up the further you go back but we're at this point now where things have changed and they've they've changed for a very, very good direction. If you're going to get any work done out in the Gulf of Mexico now, you better understand the risks involved, how to mitigate them, and how to document that you know this. We have a lot of safety meetings offshore and in, in, in a shift. You know, I'm sure you guys have probably heard of uh, JSEA, Job Safety Analysis. Mm-hmm. Before any major task steps, we'll stop and we'll get everybody that's going to be involved together and we'll just say, hey, look, this is what's coming up next. Jody's going to go down and put this clamp on, and Roy's going to hook it up to the crane, and Jonathan's going to be on your rack driving the crane operator. Nate, you just stand over there, and, and you make sure this rigging's ready to go. And, like, you put names to things, and you make sure that everybody knows what's happening. And if, if you do it right, you know, I, I try to get everybody involved and try not to, like, berate people necessarily you know for not not really knowing what the next step is and and we make sure everybody kind of is on the same page because one little mistake can be a pretty big deal in this business and uh so i've been lucky enough to you know i've I've had guys i've had friends that have gotten hurt pretty bad but anybody in this business that you know you lose a friend or a co-worker i I just it kind of hurts us all you know it's like it's a pretty small community. If you know somebody that, to be honest with you, I hate to even say it, but if, if it happens to them, you know, you know a guy that knows a guy that, that was a really good friend with that person. Mm-hmm. And there was a guy that lost his life well, maybe about 10 years ago, and he was diving, I want to say he was around 200, 300 feet. I don't know all the details off the top of my head, but what I do know is he was down there getting some work done. Good, solid diver, been around for a long time. And a manta ray swam through the area. These manta rays, they have these big horns. I mean, these things have wingspans as long as this hotel room I'm in. 
And when they're moving forward, they're a, they're a force to be reckoned with. They don't just they don't stop. And and his dive umbilical got caught in between this manta ray's horns, and it pulled him off a of bottom from that deep depth. Nothing could be done. You know, it's like uh, there was no mistakes made. You know, obviously I wasn't there, and and I hope I don't want to disrespect his friends or family by even by talking about this so much, but what could he have done? You know, and it pulled him to the surface. And, and what I heard was they got him in the chamber really fast and they blew him down back down to a, a deep treatment depth and they did everything they could, but he just didn't make it, you know? And it's like that sort of thing can happen in this business. And, uh, and then of course there's things, you know, like you get into some big rigging and rigging fails, and, but that sort of thing is thankfully, is going away, you know, and, and a lot of these dive companies, not dive companies, but yeah, dive companies and these oil companies are, are really putting their money where their mouth is. And, uh, I'll say it, it's a very positive thing, but I just did a, a big job for shell and shell is very, very safety conscious. And the thing that really impressed me about shell and the people I was working for with shell was that they backed it up. If there was something that wasn't right, Everything stopped. It didn't matter that that spread cost. It didn't matter. That thing could have, it could have cost a million dollars a second. They stopped it. They talked about it. We figured it out. We made it right. And we went back to work. And, uh, you know, that's a really good thing. And I'm very proud of how the industry has kind of gone. A lot of times we'll kind of come down on the safety guy a little bit, you know, and let's be honest, they're, they're usually weird, but <laughs> They they do a good thing, you know, and if you get a real a good safety guy out there that's done what you have done and knows what's going on and they're, they, they're doing some real good out there. And I appreciate that. So mm-hmm. there's a saying that, you know, if everybody likes the safety guy, he's probably not a, not a very good safety guy. Yeah. You know, and it, it just it, it really is a guy that everybody dumps on. But, you know, we've talked about how some safety rules are maybe gone have gone overboard. But overall, it's been a good trend. We don't have to work on bamboo scaffolds uh, in in our bare feet in this country, and uh, <laughs> you know what I mean. I mean, yeah. you know, we, we can usually get a respirator if we want one, company supplied, things like that. It's overall, it's it's a good thing. You got to take advantage of it. That's right, and you know, if everybody's on board, it is possible to be very productive and at the same time work very safely. And in a lot of ways, it's more you can be more productive when you're acting safe. Let's look at it from an oil company's perspective. The longer that that oil is not coming out of that out of the ground and into that pipe, that's costing them millions of dollars. So if the job is shut down because somebody did something, you know, they just they were horse playing or weren't really paying attention, or maybe they were put in a position that they shouldn't have been and they got hurt and it shut the job down, it can cost a lot of money, you know. So that that's kind of the why, you know. Obviously, we don't want anybody to get hurt. It's not really about money, but sort of the the effect of things can be huge, you know, just from a financial standpoint. So a lot of times, you know, if you slow down a little bit, think about what you're doing in the long run, you're saving everybody a lot of money and you're actually being a little more productive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if someone wanted to get into underwater welding, what would you say the best avenue to go down would be for them? Well, you know, um, the avenue I went on, I think, is a pretty good one. Uh, I went to a school. It's in Morgan City, Louisiana. It's called Louisiana Technical College Young Memorial Campus. And the difference between this school and every other school out there in the United States is that it's a part of a state-run vocational college system. The history of this goes back to the logging days and, you know, 150 years ago in Louisiana back in the swamps. It's subsidized by us taxpayers in Louisiana. And when I went, it cost me just over $400 for six months of training. Wow. Um, yeah, it was an excellent deal. <laughs> Cost benefit analysis has worked out well for me in terms of uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll say, school. Yeah. Pretty good ROI there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, uh, a lot of the other schools, now I don't want to, I can't really, I didn't go to these schools, so I can't talk about how good they are, but the one I went to was very good. They're not trying to make a profit, so they're not going to really call you back. You know, they're not going to hound you, and they don't really have a, a very big internet presence. So, in compared to say the for-profit schools, now I mean, some of these schools, I mean, you get the same certification, same amount of time, 
and you may pay thirty thousand dollars. So you know, I don't want to discredit these, but just you young guys thinking about this, just do me a favor and Google Young Memorial College, <laughs> uh, Louisiana Technical College, Young Memorial Campus. Just just give that place a a quick Google and uh, do a little comparison. You know, uh, and we just and, broke the internet just now. <laughs> 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 so, I'm just, I'm just kidding. They're, they're liable to get a call or two or an email as a result of you saying that. <laughs> yeah, I, well, sure I hope they, they do. You know, I, I, it was a very good school, and and really great thing about it is it's right there in the epicenter of offshore diving. So you're going to see what it's like to live in Morgan City, Louisiana, and uh, be near the dock down in Port Fouchon, and uh, you're going to be amongst people who make their living out in the oil patch and. You know, you're going to see sides of it that you may not see in Camden, New Jersey or Seattle, Washington, where some of these other places are. But, you know, and I got friends that went to these schools. And but when you come out of this school, don't expect to be a diver. You know, you're going to have to go through this apprentice program. You're going to be a tender. And I'm not going to lie. I, I think tending has the potential to be the hardest job in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, it's right up there with roustabouts and roughnecks. And it can be some of the most physically and emotionally draining work you, you could ever do. And it, it could be thankless. And let's be honest, a lot of divers, you know, there's a lot of egos in diving. And, you know, to find a diver that's respectful to a tender, is, they're not always going to be there. And once you prove yourself, you keep your head down, you keep your ears open, and you just keep yourself in the in the books and trying to learn about mechanics and rigging and come into the shop and ask the equipment manager and ask the ops manager and ask the people who run the shop and the older guys like what do i need to know to be a better tender and and they're going to tell you you know the people are going to like you if you're if you, you know not necessarily keep your mouth shut you know we we like people that make us laugh you know so that's what that's what i would say just uh just be smart about what you're getting into spend the time to really research and, and just don't jump into anything just a state some of the obvious you see these you see these internet ads for underwater welding they pop up on the, some banner ad or something like that and then you know then when you click on it you're going to get a pop up form to fill out your name and contact information and you know they're going to try to sell you on it and it's kind of like it, it kind of like whether it is or not it kind of screams you know somebody's getting a commission off this and it's just it's a money mill somebody's making a, yeah. a good little you know that's what it seems like so to to yeah, hear a, to hear of another option is uh, really is really good information and like i said it's hard to tell on the surface because there's other dry welding schools out there that have for one reason or another gotten that kind of reputation that they're just a mill you know and that uh get you plugged into government funding and all that and then then right. they don't care about you once they get their once they get their check you know so yep. it is good to hear that there's another option out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with regard to people who want to be an underwater welder, you know, there's schools who have, say, a, I can think of one in particular. I remember they had a, three different specialty courses you could take, you could sign up for. I think it was, uh, of course, underwater welding, or you could take inspections. So that would be like mag particle, UT, that sort of thing. And also, you know, first aid and like pararescue type stuff. And for me, and this is coming from, you know, I'm, I'm an underwater welding supervisor and superintendent, and I would highly recommend if you have that choice ahead of you, forget about welding for a little while. Take the, the sort of medic side, take the inspection side of things. Because if you get, you know, a lot of these places will say that you can become a certified underwater welder. Well, I got to be honest with you, I don't even know what that means outside of getting a certification at the company you work mm -hmm. so like you know are you going to get a, a fillet weld cert or american welding society in school honestly that doesn't mean anything to me as a supervisor if if you're an entry-level guy and you come in now if you came up to me and you said hey hey nate i got a my two three and four f uh broco wet welding cert in school i'd be like, all right that's great man and I would understand that that's the direction you want to go in. It would be left at that, you know. To weld on the job, you would have to take the company's weld certs because they're going to, you know, like they're going to have their own welding procedures and you're going to have to prove that you can qualify to that welding procedure specification. Now, it may kind of perk my ears up and say, oh, okay, this guy's, this is what he wants to do. 
Now, if you come in and you think, well, I'm certified, I need to be in the water, that's going to hinder you more than anything because most people are going to be like, you know, screw this guy. Give me the guy that's like down dirty working on the compressor and covered in oil, and that's the guy you want to see move up the ranks. So learn yeah. things that you don't, you may not necessarily know already. You know, you may like, I was a certified pipe welder when I went to dive school and I was fascinated by all the diving stuff. Luckily, I, I came to a company that happened to be looking for somebody like me, a young welder who they were ready to bring up through the ranks. I mean, everything kind of worked out for me in that regard. But, you know, get out of your comfort zone a little bit, learn about rigging, learn about the life support stuff. And that that's the important stuff. The welding will come. If the welder divers like you and, and they can get along with you and you're kind of in the you know, and you work hard or whatever, they're going to bring you up. You know, they're going to show you some stuff. And eventually you'll get your chance to take that test. And when you do, be ready, you know, because you may not get another test. It's not easy to take an underwater welding test because it takes a lot of support crew and it takes a lot of equipment and you got to fire up that tank. And you may work for a company that doesn't have a tank. They got to bring the whole dive shack down to the pier and set up staging to get you in the water to take it. Well, Unless they actually foresee you making them a profit, they're probably not going to do it. So just be ready. And, and But when you come in, make sure that your supervisor and make sure your operations manager know that that's what you're interested in. And just be straight up with them, man. You know, a little bit of honesty can go a long way. Just tell them this is what I'm interested in and I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to get to that point. So keep me in mind. And, you know, we spend a lot of time with each other offshore, you know, I, there's times if I'm real busy, man, I, I spend more time with my colleagues than I do with my family because, you know, we work together on the back deck for 12 to 16 hours or whatever it is. And then we, we just walk through the door and into the living quarters and hit the showers. And then you're all sleeping in beds four feet away from each other. And, uh, you know, if you're if you're easy to get along with, that's that's going to go a long way for sure. Yeah, yeah Absolutely. I can't help but think, you know, you you see ads for wherever in the American Welding Society, Welding Journal or the ads in there. And, you know, it's crystal blue water guys on some pylon down there. There's a dolphin in the distance and an octopus down here, you know, and, <laughs> and it just it paints it paints a picture very much unlike, you know, you think you think you're, you're going to get helicoptered into this job and make twenty thousand dollars. Then they're going to feed you lobster and. You're just going to be the golden child, and that's not the picture you painted at all. And, and well, that's what we really wanted to hear the real, now, the real deal. But Jody, I got to tell you, that happens every now and again. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> yeah. All right, look, man, I was uh, a few jobs back. Everybody went on the boat, went out there, and I, I was hanging back. I had some family stuff I had to take care of, and I was coming out for a welding gig. There was, there was a big job we had going on. This it was that platform I was saying where they were extending the life. Well, my part of it was the welding gig. And you know what? They, they helicoptered me out. I landed on the platform. The crane set me down on the boat. And everybody's like, oh, <laughs> you know, look, look at this guy, you know. So that happens sometimes, you know. And, and <laughs> I always tell, you know, I heard this story one time of this, this guy that came to our country and he got a job at Domino's, you know, and uh, he was from India. And he's making pizzas at Domino's. And every year he would enter this contest with Domino's to see who the fastest pizza maker could be. And he would practice and he, he started winning these contests and grand prize would be like a Mercedes Benz. Well, he won like five of these things and uh, cashed them all in and bought his own Domino's. So, hmm. you know, and was, so yeah. I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at is like, no matter what your trade is or no matter what you're doing, if you really put your effort into it and you really give it a shot and, you, you know, you don't have to do it every night, but put your head in the books and learn about the different codes and, you know, study what, what AWS puts out there and things like that. And, uh, you know, put a little effort into it. Next thing you know, somebody might helicopter you to a job, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. You know, I got to say that's when things kind of started clicking for me was when I started really hitting the books and reading all those, you know, geeky articles in the back of the Weldon Journal, trying to read them even if I didn't understand them and investing in some books on my own and actually reading them and 
you know, I went to the I went to the extent of reading uh, some codes into a cassette player and then listen to them back on my way back and forth to work. So I know that code by just by heart, you know. Wow. It's the kind of things that most people aren't willing to do that makes a difference. Most people get into welding because they're really into it. You know, you look at all these the community on Instagram, man. So many people, it's like, I don't know about you guys, but I never get tired of looking at everybody's welds and pictures of that stuff. And it's just fascinating to me. You know, there's a whole other side to things, you know, the just the history of welding and the, all the different aspects of it. And it, to me, all that stuff is so fascinating. And like, you could be reading this stuff and it's entertaining to some degree. And at the same time, teaching yourself something that you can use on the job site, you know? Yeah. I'm I'm trying to cut back. I'm uh, I'm getting too addicted to, to Instagram, you know. I'm like, dang, I spent two hours there. I should I should be at work already, you know. I want to tell you, Jody, before I forget, man. I I have used welding tips and tricks has been a a very good resource for me over the years, and I appreciate what you've put out there. And like, let's say going, you know, going back to that uh, underwater aluminum procedure set we did. You know, I was the lead welder on that, and uh, I had really never done much aluminum welding at all and your content online was a huge help to me and you know I, i've used that over and over again and i you know i appreciate what you guys are doing for sure well thanks i appreciate it you're glad yeah. it helped makes me want to do better <laughs> <laughs> want to start wrapping this one up i think so i think we yeah. covered a lot of a lot of ground and you know and we could stay on easily another couple of hours is almost an unlimited subject but i think uh Good talk. I enjoyed it. Absolutely. Very, very uh, interesting. I really appreciate you guys having me on. And uh, anytime you want to just look, if there's one thing I like talking about, it's welding. So <laughs> anytime. Uh, us too. Uh, you know, it's kind of like you're talking about hitting the books and learning. I mean, that's just one of the reasons I think why we're all enjoying doing this podcast. We get somebody on here like you, got a whole different viewpoint, different set, of, different skill set, different background. How can you not help but learn something, you know? That's and, right. And, of course, then everybody else gets to listen to it and benefit from it. And, uh, I mean, I really think you did a great job of painting a very accurate picture of the good and the bad, and that's really what we wanted. Just, you know, no, everything's not all rainbows and unicorns, but it is, <laughs> it's good work. It's a good career path and if, if, you're, if you're cut out for it. So thanks a lot. Yeah, you bet. I also have a... Instagram account. If anyone wants to check me out, it's uh, Diver Nate, Diver N, and the number eight. And I've been trying to put some pictures up there, some welds I've done and stuff. But unfortunately, over the years, I, I never really was having a whole lot of pictures taken of me. Now that I got kids, man, I really wish I had because uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure something I'd like to look back. But, you know, I still got a lot of years of diving left. So I got that camera on me now. Cool. You know who really got me kind of hooked on Instagram was Isaac at at IC Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, he kind of like what he does with heavy equipment, the type of welding and fabrication he does is very similar to what we do in my field, you know, kind of about 99% structural and like sort of heavy stuff and stick welding. And, and so that guy's, he's to me, he's incredible. And I, I've learned some stuff watching his. So if you're listening, Isaac, thanks, man. I appreciate what you're putting on there. Isaac is the man, you know, he's just oh, yeah. a great, great guy, he's a wealth of information, lots of just down and dirty tips. But I was thinking when you were talking about having to have your crap together, like if you, you know, you pump all the water out and you, know, you forgot a tool or you didn't bring two tools and you dropped one. And, you know, it's a little bit like that with Isaac. If he drives a couple hundred miles and doesn't carry the stuff that he needs, he's in a jam. So he's got to be a self-contained working unit in his rig wherever he goes and, that's right uh, yeah yeah it's fun to look at all the you know you, i guess it's hashtag welding rigs and it's fun to look at all those pretty welding rigs with the big rims on them and everything shiny rims and everything but man isaac's truck to me is a it's a working truck you know that's the money mm -hmm. maker as far as i'm concerned so yep, yep i agree his wife's truck's really nice <laughs> yeah i just saw i actually i just saw some pictures he posted i think it was yesterday of his wife out there welding yeah. Well, again, Nate, we really want to thank you for being on. Um, I know we've already said it. You you explain things very well, and I know all the listeners will be just like I was, just in awe of a lot of things that you said. Um, so, again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, guys. 
Like I said, I, I use your content as reference. I really love what Welding Tips and Tricks is doing. It's not easy to put yourself out there like that. I was very nervous right before you guys called me. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to continue checking everything you guys out. I think, uh, I think, Jody, you just posted a new video just today, I believe, about doing some TIG welding stuff. So I'll be checking that out. But keep it up, guys. I, I very much appreciate it. Thanks for being on. Well, cool. We'll be, we'll be following you on Instagram. Don't worry. All right. Yeah. <laughs> what would be a good place to get a hold of you for any other information? Well, definitely the the Instagram messaging. People have been hitting me up on there. Come on that that page we were talking about earlier, Diver Nate, and just in uh, direct message me, or you can email me. My personal email address is AquaArc One. That's A Q U A. ARC, the number one, at cox.net. And any questions at all, man? You know, uh, over the last five years, I've been supervising and superintendent. And I, a young tender asked me just a couple months ago what my favorite part of my job is these days. I thought about it for a second. And truly, the thing I enjoy most is telling the younger guys coming up pretty much everything I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm an open book. I got nothing to hide. I don't care if there's something that took me 20 years to learn. I'll I'll tell you best I can in five minutes. So anything you guys want to know, you let me know. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. We want to thank all our patrons over on Patreon.com. Um, that's definitely a, a growing thing now. We're very appreciative of everyone who supports us and supports the show over there, especially Scott Silva, Philip Kaminsky, and Dave Horvath. We really appreciate that. If you'd like to support the show as well, Head on over to patreon.com forward slash welding tips and tricks podcast. And if you'd like to reach us here at the podcast, our email is welding tips and tricks at gmail.com. Also, if you'd like to call in and leave us a voicemail, our phone number is 915 308 7024. I'm Roy Crumrun. I'm Jody Collier. And I'm Jonathan Lewis. I'm Nate Martin. This has been Welding Tips and Trips Podcast. Make it cold. All right, now you got to explain <laughs> the diver's saying All right, now. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that makes sense to everybody. <laughs> when you want to turn off the weld machine so you don't get shocked changing out the rod, we say make it cold. And then when you're ready to start welding again, make it hot. Yeah. <laughs> that works. That's awesome. Where's fire in the hole coming in on there? <laughs> <laughs> That's when you're scrambling up the downline, getting as far away from it as you can. <laughs> Okay. That's probably not a good thing you want to hear when you're down no. 300 feet below. Fire it hole. No. <laughs> Wait a minute, what? Yeah. All right, that was awesome. <laughs>